Thank you very much. Well, I'm so glad you decided to come and join me. Um, I think I'm going to make your time worthwhile. Um, as she explained, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Um, as she explained, I'm the director of Florida Interfaith Network and Networking and Disaster. I became that in 1998. But actually, I have been involved and responded to every catastrophic event that's hit the state of Florida since 1992 when Hurricane Andrew hit. Um, my job as the director of FIND was to, one of, one of a number of things, was to go in a community after it had been affected by a disaster and to set up what they now refer to as a long-term recovery organization. Now this brought the faith community together with social service or other social service organizations like Red Cross, Salvation Army, government, for-profit businesses. And actually my role became, especially in a major event like Charlie made landfall and Ivan made landfall in Pensacola, to stand up literally a multi-million dollar construction company. Because what I was going to do was connect that long-term recovery group with national resources, national donated resources, as well as connect them to the governor's recovery fund. And I tell you this to help you understand that I have sadly dealt with, worked with, and tried to help recover literally thousands of Floridians. It didn't take me very long to become a champion and a believer in mitigation. What's mitigation mean? Who can tell me what mitigation means? Stop things, they happen. Stop things before they happen. Okay. The way I like to describe it is, it's anything we can do today that will either lessen or eliminate the impact of something in the future. Now, having to do with this workshop, we're talking about wind, and we're talking about how it's going to affect and how we prevent it from negatively affecting impact on your residents. This workshop is funded by a program under the Division of Emergency Management through Volunteer Florida, and um, they actually have contracted with me to do it. This is the third year I've gone around and given this workshop. It's a very important message. This is what we typically deal with in the summertime, isn't it? But every so often, sadly, we deal with this. Back after Hurricane Hugo, most especially, maybe probably even before that, the insurance industry across the country said, we can't keep doing this. We can't keep paying these horrendous claims. We'll go out of business. So they started doing research. They said there's got to be a way to build a house that can sustain the wind. So they did a lot of research over the years. So what I'm going to show you today, I want you to understand, is based on research, and they have figured out how to save your house. Benefits. How long do you figure it takes in the aftermath of a disaster event, catastrophic disaster, for the average family to rebuild their homes? Insured or uninsured, what's the average? The average typically is 18 months. But that actually can be drawn out two years, three years, four years. And let me explain to you, we're pretty lucky in the state of Florida we haven't had to move people out of the state like they did in Katrina. You know, Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama, they had to literally move their citizens to Ohio, New York, Minnesota. Can you imagine? But I can sadly tell you that we've had to move people certainly out of their communities, and in many cases move them out of their county because there was no place for them to live. So do not assume that if it's your community's turn to be affected by a catastrophic event, that there's going to be a nice little hotel down the road you get to stay in, or there are going to be rentals out there for you to, be mo for you to move into. May not be the case. People for years 
if they're somewhat lucky, which I don't consider them particularly lucky, have had to move their families into FEMA trailers. We've all heard about FEMA trailers, haven't we? How'd you like to move your family into and have to live someplace for 18 months to two to three years, a concrete parking lot with a 12 by 60 mobile home? Now, some people were really lucky. They got to live in a travel trailer in their front yard. It is not something you want to do. And I am here doing these workshops because I am passionate about saving you from that pain and suffering. I am not here for the second benefit, and what's that? What's the second benefit of mitigating your house? Saving on your insurance, absolutely. You can save on your insurance. I give the Florida home builders all the credit in the world for this. They said, hey, it's going to cost us more after the 2002 um, Unified Building Code went into effect, they said, it's going to cost us more to build that house. And if that homeowner pays more for that new construction, that new house that's stronger, that's going to withstand the wind, you're not going to have a claim, Mr. Insurance Company. Why should they pay as much in premiums as the person who hasn't done anything and their house isn't strong? The legislature agreed with them, and so we have insurance discounts. Do it yourself. Years ago, when I started doing this, I used to say, hey, you can do a lot of this yourself. I would discourage you today from doing it yourself if you want to get discounts from the insurance company. Keep in mind, insurance companies are not in the business of saving you money. They are not crazy about having to give these discounts and they make it, frankly, tougher and tougher. Used to be a two-page two form that the inspector had to fill out. Now it's four pages long. They make it tougher and tougher for you to qualify. Far more difficult if you do something yourself and you cannot prove that it was done by a professional right, you may not get a discount. Continuous load. I'm going to run through these really quickly. Continuous, who can define continuous load for me? Yes, yes. What we're talking about, we got the wall, or we got the roof, we got the walls, we got the foundation. What they figured out, we got to keep that all tied together. So actually, I could turn that whole unit upside down, hang it up, and everything stay together. Okay? Who can tell me what a soffit is? It's under the eave, isn't it? It's the underside of the overhang. Okay, and what about uh, a gable? What's a gable? Mm -hmm. Prior to Hurricane Andrew, a lot of our architecture in Florida included gable ends up in our roofs. Today, not so much. Today, we have typically more what we refer to as a hip roof, which is more like a pyramid. But there are things we can do to our gable roofs, because many, many of us have them, um, to strengthen them. I'll talk about that. Here's what it's all about, y'all wind pressure. And we asked the engineer, we said, well, how can I explain wind pressure to you? And he said, here's the way I like to explain it. I'm sitting at my kitchen table. It's a beautiful spring morning. There's a little light breeze blowing. I got the back door open, reading the newspaper. There's a knock at the front door. I go race into the front door, because I think it might be the little girl selling Girl Scout cookies. Don't want to miss her. I open the front door and what happens? Immediately. What happens? Back door slams, doesn't it? Back door slams. We've all had that happen. I can promise you the wind did not come through fast enough, nor strong enough, that little light breeze, to slam that back door. This is what it's all about, y'all. See over there on the left, the wind comes in the house. What actually happens on the, what they call the leeward side, the opposite side, is there's actually a suction, a very strong suction that occurs. In fact, it's exponentially stronger than that little tiny bree light breeze that was blowing. Here's the way, just think about it. In Hurricane Andrew and Charlie and Jean and Francis and Ivan, Wilma, the shingles on the roofs weren't blown off. 
They were sucked off. You know, my husband's a general contractor. He said, I never, had, I never thought I had to worry about things going up. We just worried about them not coming down, not falling down. The insurance industry has been working hard on this, as I said. And I give the Institute for Bus Insurance Industry for uh, Business and Home Safety. They actually, they're a national corporation. And what they have, in fact, done is they have um, created a program that they call a fortified home. And it's a standard. And let me share with you, you know, for years we've thought, oh, well, you've got to build it to code. You know, you have to build it to code. You have to follow the building code. I want you to begin to understand that the building code is only the minimum. It's the minimum we have to do, but you can do a whole lot more to protect your home. And that's what their fortified standard is. They set up this standard, and they encourage people to go beyond code when they build their houses. Now... The good news is in the state of Florida, you know, we had our first unified code in 2002, which implemented uh, lessons learned from Hurricane Andrew. And then two years ago in 2012, they strengthened the code again. We're getting closer to the fortified code. But there are things that we don't have. Now, I want to show you a little, a little video here. What they did, remember I told you, they did a lot of research. They've done a lot of research. And one of the things they did, they built this big warehouse and they have this big wall of fans that they can simulate up to 100 mile an hour winds. And they built two houses. They built one house to the fortified standard and they built a second house about the code and the way houses were being built back around the time of Hurricane Andrew. Now I'm going to go turn this video on so don't you all run off. Now, it doesn't have any sound, so we, we're good there. Um, they built two houses. The house on the left, standard of 1992, code standards, typical what you might see then. You can see their fortified house sustained virtually no damage. And you can begin to see, see they built these two houses on a turntable, so they're able to turn the table so they can shoot wind at it in different directions. It's my understanding in this video, they rebuilt the house on the left five times. They never had to rebuild the house on the right. It survived the storm. The house on the right, you know, the, the fortified standard. Oh, no, 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 no. This goes beyond code. Beyond code. It's their standard. Now look at the front door and then see what happens. Soon as the front door was breached, it wasn't very long. Now watch the front door and then watch the side door. See how fast that happens? Watch what comes out with the side door. the frame. Whole lot about construction that we need to change. And we're in the process of changing it. And now we know how to change it. The good news is not only are we able to change it in our building codes for new construction, but there are lots of things you can do to existing houses to strengthen them against the storm. Your house is your greatest asset, is for most of us anyway. How many of you in this room can afford to lose your house? I mean, no insurance, your house blows away and you just walk away? I don't want to scare everybody, but frankly, that's my job. We are this close to not having insurance. How many of you are insured by citizens? The good news is it's getting to be a little less than it was a year ago. But let me explain the situation with citizens, and I can promise you your for-profit insurance companies are not in a whole lot different shape. Two years ago, citizens, 
the senator who headed up the, uh, the, the Florida Insurance Committee came to one of my workshops and I thought, you know, he's probably going to give me a hard time and fuss at me about scaring people about insurance. He said, no, Jody, he said, you are right on. He said, Citizens has $7 billion in the bank. Sounds like a lot of money, doesn't it? $700 billion in written risk. $700 billion. You know where that risk is written? Miami-Dade, West Palm, coming up the East Coast here, Naples, Sarasota, God forbid, Tampa Bay. Any storm, frankly, at this point, any storm that would hit any one of those areas will put citizens out of business. God forbid a storm comes across the state. We who are insured with citizens, and I happen to be one of them, there will not be enough money to pay the claims. I promise you, there will not be. And let me tell you what your insurance companies have done if they're not citizens, if it's other insurance companies. After Hurricane Andrew, they said, you know, these, these storms can put us out of business. So they, in fact, created insurance companies and incorporated in the state of Florida. So you do not necessarily have access to their national resources. Sadly, Governor Scott almost did it, and sadly he should have done it. Our insurance premiums today, to get them anywhere close to being actuarially sound, what we should be paying, should be at least double what we're paying. That's the situation we're in. If we mitigate, we reduce damage. You know, we don't, you got a house to go back to. We don't have all that debris. We've all seen pictures of the debris in the aftermath of a disaster with all the housing debris, haven't we? Or we've seen it in person. Sure, FEMA comes in and pays 75% of the bill to clean up that debris. Who's FEMA? We, the taxpayers, are FEMA. Reduced insurance premiums. You can save up to 85% of the wind portion of your, win of your insurance if you do everything that you can do to mitigate your house. I'm a real estate broker. I've been a real estate broker for 30 years. I know how the game's played. I got your house listed. You've mitigated your house. You're down the street. You got your house for sale some other realtor, you haven't done anything to, to mitigate your house. Which house do you think I'm going to be able to sell faster? Which house do you think I'm going to be able to sell for more money? Because by the time I get through with the customers, they're not going to want that house. They're going to want a house that's been mitigated so they're pretty well assured that in the disaster's aftermath, they have a house to live in and come home to. And he's going to save $2,000 a year on his insurance. I mean, it's an easy sell, guys. And I can promise you the people who are coming down here from Sandy Country, New York, New Jersey, who were affected by Hurricane Sandy, I can promise you they are coming down here asking questions, and they're asking the right questions. And they're not buying houses that there's a fear that the house won't survive the storm. Now, I don't have to convince you all because you lived through 2004 and 2005, but I'll tell you, the people on the West Coast, there are people over there, and they tell me every year when I'm over there in Sarasota area, they say, eh, we aren't going to get hit by a storm. Nah. We got these Indian mounds, you know? The Indian mounds in the, in the burial grounds, they keep, they keep, the spirits keep the storms away. I can promise you that is as actual or as, as sound scientific a reason why they haven't been hit recently as any there is. There is no, nothing keeping storms away from anywhere. It is only a matter of time. We know it's only a matter of time. I can't tell you when it's going to happen next and I can't tell you where it's going to happen. This is a map showing the storm's paths for the last hundred years. 
not much of any place in Florida that hasn't been affected. Two years ago when they changed the, uh, the hurricane uh, or the uh, unified building code, strengthened it, they came out with a new windborne debris map. And you can see over here what those lines are. Is that showing today new construction? Or if you do major renovation, you have to build to sustain 180 mile an hour winds down in Miami-Dade area. And as you go up, you can see 170. You guys are, looks like maybe you're between 160, 170 miles an hour. The other thing that this map is showing Windborne debris area, if you build new construction or you do major renovation, you are required to have opening protection. Okay, now, older houses, I got a couple of them, you know, they're not forcing you to have opening protection, but what this map is telling you, if you live within the windborne debris area, you should have opening protection. Remember what we want to keep out of the house. What do we want to keep out of the house? The wind. If we can keep the wind out of the house, we can keep the house together and you have a house to come home to. What this map shows is the, the pink, or fuchsia, was the existing windborne debris map. They increased it, the turquoise you see there, that's what they increased it. I will also tell you that the for-profit insurance companies are taking a look at this map and they're saying, you know, it's getting pretty risky to insure anybody in a windborne debris area. They want me to share, if you're doing any of this work, please make sure, if it's a permittable thing that gets done, make sure you pull a permit. Do not let somebody just come in, a handyman come in and do some of this stuff and not pull a permit if you want to get a discount on your insurance. Sadly, I was at a workshop over in Charlotte County and there was a sweet couple that came in and they explained that they had damage in Hurricane Charlie. They had their roof repaired because there was so much damage, so much roof damage, Charlotte County relaxed the rules and did not require an inspection. Insurance company came along and said, uh-uh, we're not buying it. You have to take your roof off and show us how your, how your plywood, how your plywood, plywood is nailed before we'll give you insurance. So be careful, be very careful. Types of mitigation. We said, and let me repeat it again, we want to keep wind out of the house, right? There's a second thing that Hurricane Charlie most especially taught us. We need to keep water out of the house. How's water get in the house? Give me some ideas. Leaky roof? Leaky windows and doors? Well, I'm not, this isn't flood now. We're just talking. In Hurricane Charlie, one of the things that happened was in the Orlando area, and now we're talking the center of the state, guys. We never thought there'd be big damage there. Water was driven right through the walls. The stucco failed and the paint that was on the outside of these houses failed, and water came right through the walls. Unfortunately, last year, the year before last, her, her Tropical Storm Debbie came through, and it did some havoc on the West Coast, but then it went inland in Lake City, Live Oak area. Unfortunately, there's a huge population of retired up there, low, moderate income, lots of veterans, didn't have the money to repair their roofs. Owned their house, didn't have to have insurance. Didn't, hadn't, hadn't repaired their roofs. And they, looked like, they, they leaked like sieves. I mean, we had hundreds and hundreds of families whose houses were completely inundated with water. If you need a new roof, and I've said this for years before I ever got involved in doing this, because I just see it. If you need a new roof, I strongly recommend you get your roof replaced now. Houses that have new roofs survive. Houses that don't, don't. Types of roofs. There's, a product, there's some products out there today. First of all, if, and I'm not telling you to tear your roof off to do this, but if you are replacing your roof, 
you need to put on what they refer to as a secondary water barrier. But the first thing they're going to do, like I have a house in Venice, uh, the roof was replaced in 1998. Now there's a chance that when it was replaced that the roofer went ahead, because that was before the unified code, when it told them they had to do more nailing of the sheeting. There's a good chance it was done then. But they're going to re-nail the roof. Now when you get when you have it off and you just have the sheeting, I want you, once that's been remailed, I want you to make sure you send a camera up on that roof and take a picture. Because once they put the roof in on it, you're not going to be able to prove how it was nailed. The second thing, it looks like there, it looks like uh, contact paper, doesn't it? Or, or not, uh, like uh, duct tape. It's actually a product that's designed to be taped, so you tape the joints of the plywood. Just a second chance to keep the water out of your house. There's another product, an underlayment product, that's like contact paper. It's, it's, it's a big, big sheet, and you peel the back off of it, and they put it on the roof, on the sheeting, before they put the uh, tar paper or any of the, the roofing, um, final roofing product. There are those who are becoming concerned about that full underlayment. Because they're saying, you know, we haven't had it around that long. And they're getting concerned about the fact that the full underlayment is rotting the plywood. So unfortunately, they haven't done as much research on water as they've done on wind. So stay tuned. You might want to consider the tape rather than the full underlayment. Types of roof, shingles, tile, metal, they are all good as long as they are the new product, the post-2002 product, and they're properly installed. They'll, they should all hold up just fine. If you're not going to replace your roof anytime soon, there's another option out there for you to get a secondary water barrier. It's a foam. It's a polyurethane foam that they spray along the joint of the truss and the plywood. It provides two things. It provides secondary water barrier, but it also provides strength in case you happen to be one of the homes that they didn't do a very good job of nailing down your plywood. Up in the gables, many of our gables have vents. You can replace that vent with a vent you can close. You can go up there and Close it up when the wind's threatening. If you have ridge vents, one of the things we recommend you consider doing is getting, you know, the noodles, like the, the styrofoam things you use in the swimming pool? Stuff them into those areas up in your attic. If you have turbines on your house, you need to get rid of them. They are not going to survive the storm. Now, let me tell you, you see the lower middle picture? How many of y'all have that kind of soffit material with all the holes? Aluminum, vinyl? Let me tell you what happens. This happened to me. Francis came over our house as a tropical storm. Everything seemed to be okay, except my front yard was littered with panels like that. I said to my husband, a general contractor, I said, what happened? He said, well, Jody, he said, the deal is, is that there's a channel that's on the outer eave, and there's a channel up against the house. And they just slide the panels in there. Nothing holding them up there. There's no, no structure, no, no, nothing solid up there. Well, I was lucky. We just had the panels come out. Down in Charlie country, they weren't so lucky, many of them. The panels came out, and there was like a vacuum effect. And water literally was sucked up through that soffit area into the attic. Three weeks later, their houses were totally inundated with mold and mildew and had to be completely gutted. Now, there's a few options. One is to do what I did. We replaced our soffit with a solid soffit that has way less holes in it, but it's a solid and we put bracing up there so it's gonna stay in there. A second option is to replace your soffit and there's there's a variety of different op possibilities there you can see the one over on the right 
It's a solid soffit and it has um, vents in it. Now there's a product up here, a vent that I brought, and it evidently automatically open or closes when the barometric pressure gets to a certain point and it opens back up when it gets back to normal. Now, virtually all of our attics are designed to have airflow. So you can't just close them up and leave them closed up. That's, that's just not a, an option. If you have the kind of soffit that's in the middle and you don't want to replace it, I want you to at least do this. I want you to caulk it, and I want you to see if you can put some screws in it to try and hold those panels in there. I can't promise it'll solve the problem, but you got a 50-50 chance that way that they'll stay in there. Gable ends. Saw a lot of this in Hurricane's path. They just never bothered, believe it or not, they never bothered in most houses to brace the ends of the house. And the gables fail and they fall out. Brace your gables. You can see there, you take wood, plywood, or not plywood, two by fours, and you get up there and you brace it back along the truss. You can see there on the right, um, or on the left, you can see that picture there and you see the white boards. That comes to us from Rebuild Northwest Florida and we said to them, well, what are the white boards? And they said, that's where we brace the trusses. And we said, how come they're white? They said, we paint them white so the inspector can see them. How many of y'all have had your houses inspected? I strongly recommend you get your house inspected for a wind inspection. As I say, I got a house in Venice, Florida. I was doing some insurance a few years ago, and the insurance agent said, you had your house inspected? I said, no, isn't that odd? I do this for a living, and I haven't had my house inspected. So he said, well, it only costs $75, and I think your house might have hurricane clips, because back in 1998, around here, when people replaced their roofs, they put hurricane clips on. He said, if it's got hurricane clips, I can save you about $300 on your insurance. Had the inspection, sure enough, had hurricane clips, $350 savings. I didn't do a thing. And that's $350 and that inspection's good for five years. So in essence, I saved like what? $1,500. Strongly recommend you get your house inspected along with everything else I'm encouraging you to do. But you need to make sure as you go through what you do do, that you document what you've done. Hurricane clips. Those, you can see, see the metal, that's the truss coming in there. That's what this little display is all about. Hurricane clip, hurricane clip, truss coming down, plate. Today, continuous load, we tie everything together. We're trying to keep everything tied together. Hurricane clips are good, but if in fact you're replacing your roof, I want you to consider taking the outer layer of plywood off all the way around and strapping your trusses. Taking straps, metal straps, and running them over the truss and tying them down to the wall. That's the best. And keep in mind, remember what I said. I'm not up here to save you money. I'm up here to save your house. That's what I recommend you do. Continuous load, you can see here, new construction or whatever you can come up with to do to keep it all tied together. Keep that roof on that house, keep the walls on there. It's a little tougher on the foundation, but I will tell you, even though it wasn't a requirement, many of our good builders did put bolts in the foundation and bolted the, bolted the lower plate to the foundation. Here's what they didn't do. In many cases, if they had a stud wall, when they put the studs into it, they just put a nail and toenailed it into it. They never solidif strongly tied that stud to the foundation. So 
just sort of think in terms of this metal piece right here, that you would in fact be able to turn it upside down and tie your lower plate and your studs together. Take your siding off and get that done. May save your house. Remember that, don't forget about your porches and your overhangs. And I also want to share with you, you don't want to forget about your neighbor's porches and overhangs. You can do everything in the world to your house, but if your neighbor doesn't across the street and their front porch comes off, it can easily either end up in your living room if you don't have opening protection, or certainly it can knock off a portion of your roof. It's happened. Let me share with you how for years they install windows and doors. For years, you know, we've seen it. You're driving by and it's a new house. There's a hole here and you say, oh, there's going to be a window there and there's going to be a door there. That's what they did. They try and make those openings as close to the size they needed. And then they just take the window and the door and they just set it in there. Now, if you were lucky and it was close to tight enough, sometimes it was, sometimes it wasn't, they might put a few shims in, stuff a little insulation in, then they just brought the stucco or the siding right up to it. They never sunk bolts from the door and the window jams into the walls. Never did it. You remember in the video how the whole door frame came out with that door? That's what's going on. Inspect your windows and doors Hopefully there may be something you can do about it, but I want to strongly recommend you consider replacing your windows and doors, exterior windows and doors, with wind-rated windows and doors. Um, it's my understanding today you can't buy, like Home Depot, Lowe's, you cannot buy a window or a door in Florida that's not wind-rated. Do not go to Ohio or Michigan and bring doors and windows down here and think you're going to use them in Florida. You're just, they're not going to let you but it wouldn't be a very smart thing to do. They are designed to help withstand the wind. Now, when you go to buy windows and doors, I want you to make sure in anything you buy like that, I want you, in fact, out here, I want you to look for sticker. There'll be a sticker on the window or the door or the shutter or whatever, and it will say Miami Date Approved or a building code equivalent. And if it doesn't, don't waste your money. What they have to do, product, people with products to withstand the wind, they have to take them through a testing program. If they pass, they get an approval sticker. If they don't, they don't. Unfortunately, the vendor who does not sell the approved products can still sell them to you. They just may not, they just may fail. So be careful. If you have your windows and doors replaced and you have the new construction, we have to, we have to become a society that understands we're going to be a society of a bunch of stickers on our windows and doors. Make sure that your installer does not remove the sticker and your painter does not paint over it because your insurance inspector has got, that's the only way in some cases, they're getting better today. They're starting to figure out ways to put permanent markings on the windows and doors to prove that they've been approved. But that's the only way today. You want to take a picture of that sticker on that door on your house, and I want you to go home and make up a manila folder and put on it house mitigation. And I want you to put any and every piece of documentation that you've done anything to your house in that folder. Now the good news is today, a couple of years ago it wasn't the case, but today virtually every county requires you pull a building permit if you replace a window or a door. They will also require that you tell them what kind of windows and doors you're putting in and they will keep track of that. In fact, down in West Palm, we had a building official there yesterday when I did the workshop, and he said they actually now are keeping even pictures. And the roofers are taking pictures and sending them pictures to put in the permanent file. A good thing to do. 
Okay, opening protection. Let's talk about that. Insurance companies are not, most of them are not going to give you a discount for plywood as your opening protection. It is still acceptable under the Florida Building Code, but they have changed it that it has to be 5 8 inch plywood. Now, if you're going to use plywood, I want you to understand you need to make your op the plywood come six inches outside of the opening. Do not cut the plywood and put it right in the window. Remember how the whole frame comes out. Steel panels. We've all seen them, metal panels. We've all seen them, strips. If that, that's probably the second least expensive that you got up here. If, in fact, that's your choice, then I want you to strongly, well, let me just tell you a brief story. I have a friend down in Miami-Dade County, and she bought a new house. And I was walking in her garage, through her garage, and there was this tall stack of metal panels. And I said to her, I said, one of those, and she said, oh, that's our opening protection. I'm walking in her house, she's got a nice two-story living room, lots of windows up high. You know, it's a two-story house, and I'm looking at her, and she's a little older than I am, a little chubbier, a lot less mobile, and her husband's not much different. I said, how are you going to get those metal panels up there? She said, oh, it's not a problem, Jody. She said, the, the guy down the street said he'll install them for us for $200. I said, okay. I said, when are you going to put them up next week? She said, why would we do that? It's only the 1st of June, and there's no storm threatening out there. I said, because he probably told the other 600 families in this new development that he put theirs up too. So be careful here. Have a plan, and let me tell you why. You have to have a plan to make sure if this is what you're going to do. And especially if you've taken a discount from your insurance company, make sure you get these things up. Because after visiting Judith, I happened to be going to a bunch of meetings with some pretty big wig insurance folks. And I asked them, I said, so tell me, if I have a house and I take a discount for my opening protection, but I'm visiting my Aunt Mary in Ohio, and I don't get my opening protection up because there was nobody, you know, he couldn't get to mine with the other 400 he was trying to put up. What happens? For years, they would not give me an answer. I mean, for years, they would not answer me. Finally, they gave me the answer. We will reimburse them the premium they paid for the year, but we will not honor the claim. Now, two years ago, I got a letter, or a year ago, I got a letter from Citizens. And they said, well, we've evaluated it, and we'll pay the claim, but we will significantly discount it. So be careful, guys. If you take a discount for opening protection, rem be sure that it includes a method and, and that you're, you know, that you're going to get it up or don't take the discount, or you may not be insured. Accordion shutters, um, one of our nice vendors out here in the hall uh, left his display in here for me, so go visit him. Um, we've all seen them, accordion shutters that open and close. These actually have little windows in them, and that's sort of cool. Um, they also have accordion shutters that'll go this way. but. You remember what I said, somebody's still got to close that shutter. Somebody's got to be there to close that shutter, and if they don't close the shutter, even though it was there, you're not necessarily going to be insured. That's why I like this product. This is an impact-resistant glass window. It is very expensive. Impact-resistant glass is expensive, but it's there. You don't have to do anything. So you might, depending upon your situation, you might consider it. I will also tell you, I believe you put, especially install this in your house, and I believe you'll get a lot more money for your house if you go to sell it. It will increase the value of your house. Other people understand. Now, keep in mind, impact-resistant glass breaks. I've been, had this little sample, I used to, 
hand them around, but the problem is I just throw them in my little box as I traveled, and yeah, it breaks. The thing that doesn't break and keeps the wind out is there's a filament piece that's in between two, the two layers of glass. Now, insurance companies don't love impact-resistant glass. Not because it doesn't work, but it's expensive if they have to replace the glass. Fabric shutters, we're seeing more and more of that today. Uh, here's some samples. You can either strap it in if you want to see some sample. I don't know whether Home Depot's and Lowe's show samples of this or not. It's typically for large openings, you know, maybe a hole in eye opening or a big door opening area. It is not inexpensive. It's expensive. Um, but it will work. It does not totally keep the wind out, but it certainly keeps enough wind out and force out to keep your, keep your windows and doors protected. You do not put this product right up against a window. It'll break it. It's for like an opening that you, you know, you're a good distance away from the actual window. Masking tape. If you have nothing better to do for two hours to 10 hours to 20 hours after the wind stops blowing, I do not want you to consider putting masking tape on your windows when the storm threatens. It does absolutely no good whatsoever. And it will take you two hours, 10 hours, 20 hours, if you can ever get it back off your windows after, those, after it's sat out there in that wonderful Florida sun for two or three or 10 or 20 days or 100 days till you get around to it. Trust me, do not install masking tape in fact, I think Lowe's and Home Depot, I need to have them be in my workshop so that they would be embarrassed to even sell it to you. They need to put a big sign up saying, do not put masking tape on your windows. Where did my little thing go? Here we go. Easy fix here, guys. How many of your front doors, side doors open in? Replace your door. It should open out with a wind-rated door, with a sticker on it. Wind-rated doors are stronger. They have more hinges. The hinges have more bolts in them or screws in them. You want a three or a, a one-inch deadbolt on all your exterior doors. Hold them in there. Hold them in there. And it's very important that if you have your door replaced or even your existing door, make sure it's properly installed. Make sure there are, in fact, screws going in all the way around. Depending upon the door, depending upon the product, they'd be maybe 8 inches, 12 inches, every 8 or 12 inches, all the way around. Another easy fix. Your opening for your garage door is a huge opening. Your garage door fails, your house is toast. Replace your garage door. It's not a very expensive, in, in the realm of things, not particularly expensive to do. I just replaced the garage door in Venice, $1,300. Actually, it needed, and it was like, I don't know how old it was, but it needed a new spring anyway. The new spring was $800, and it was $500 more to replace the whole door. With a wind-rated, impact-resistant, Miami Date-approved door. Please. Don't go away here, from here not understanding that you want to buy, if you buy, if you spend your money, make sure it's Miami Date approved. And look out here, you'll see from these vendors I saw, some of them it's very visible, that they have taken the time and the effort and been responsible enough to get Miami Date approval on their products. Okay? When I gave a workshop in, uh, Charlotte, workshop in Charlotte County, the emergency manager was there. And he said, yeah, he said, you know, when Miami-Dade started their approval process and lots of products were no, that were being sold in Miami-Dade County no longer qualified, he said, we know where they 
brought a bunch of those and sold them. They brought them up here to Charlotte County and sold them to citizens. And when Charlie hit, they failed. So be careful. Don't assume, make them prove it to you. Does everybody have a better idea now of why we want to mitigate? I want to thank you for being here. I hope I've shared some information with you. I hope I didn't scare you too much, but you know what? The truth's the truth. And if I save one or two of your houses, my time's well spent. So thank you very much.